Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Ladaris Cordell, retired California State Court judge and a grandmother, and your moderator for this program. Tonight's program is part of the club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our special guest, Leslie Stahl, correspondent for CBS 60 Minutes and author of the new book, <laughs> Being Grandma, The Joys and Science of the New Grandparenting. Leslie Stahl stands as an icon in the field of broadcast journalism. In 25 years as a 60 Minutes correspondent and prior to that as CBS News White House correspondent, she has interviewed the likes of Margaret Thatcher, Boris Yeltsin, Yasser Arafat, and virtually every top U.S. official. Tonight, we'll have a wide-ranging conversation with Ms. Stahl and discuss what she says is her most transformative life experience, becoming a grandmother. Ms. Stahl says the therapeutic effects of grandchildren on grandparents and families in general are eye-opening. In her professional life, Leslie Stahl has covered Watergate, the assassination attempt on President Reagan and the 1991 Gulf War. Her 60-minute pieces have encompassed terrorist capabilities to hack the U.S. infrastructure, a profile of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, an inside look at the Guantanamo Bay prison, China's huge real estate bubble, and just recently, insurance fraud. I'm so pleased that we now get to have our own 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl. <laughs> so please give her a warm Commonwealth Club welcome. So Leslie, I'm delighted you've given us the opportunity to chat with you. And did you know that your book, Becoming Grandma, has sparked an upsurge in books about grandparenting? It's hit a nerve. And I just came across one hot off the press. You ready? Right out of Costco. <laughs> and this Whoa. is called How to Babysit a Grandma. <laughs> yeah. And I'm gonna give this, <laughs> give this to you as a gift. Aww. It's yours, all right. So Becoming Grandma is a terrific read, by the way. This is part memoir and with fascinating information about grandparenting in all of its forms. And as I was reading this book, I kept thinking, whoa, I didn't know that. And that's the same reaction I have, Leslie, when I watch you bring your stories to life on 60 Minutes. I didn't realize until I read your book that there are a variety of species of grandparents, biological, uh, grandparents-in-law, step-grandparents, surrogate grandparents, trans grandparents, <laughs> granny nannies, retired grandfather nannies, working grannies, it goes on and on. So, <laughs> so, let's, so let's start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little about your grandparents, your parents, and your own family? Oh, okay. Well, the, the only grandparent I really knew was my grandfather on my father's side. And he lived near us, and uh, I was his first. So I knew he loved me more than anything on earth. <laughs> and my, fa my father worked f with him for him. And the truth is my dad was afraid of my, his father. So he was a big guy. Everybody called my grandfather boss. Except I wasn't afraid of him. So my dad used to have me go and tell him bad news because he didn't <laughs> want to do it. Not even kidding. So uh, I, I adored my grandfather. He grew up right down. This, uh, I grew up down the street from him. And, um, this was in New York? <clears throat> this was in a small town in northern Massachusetts yes. called Swampscott, Massachusetts. That's right. You know it? <laughs> and my dad grew up in Peabody, Massachusetts. And my grandparents lived in Peabody uh, for when my, until I was probably about 10. And then they moved down the street from us, like grandparents are doing today all across the country moving from one coast to the other to, no, no, you're shaking your head, but they are, moving to be near their grandchildren, which I applaud. <clears throat> there you go. So what was it your mother said to you about having a child? Oh, well, my mother, whose name was Dolly, was a work. And my <laughs> mother said, do not have children. To me, she said, do not have children they'll ruin your life. <laughs> so we know what we're dealing with with my mother right here and then. 
Then, when I got to what then was considered the absolute last year that a woman could ever have a child, 35, she panicked and said, oh my God, I made a big mistake. And I was 35, she was still buying my clothes for me, and if she said to don't do it, I didn't do it, if she said do it, she said, you have to have a child. <clears throat> and I did, right That I did. <laughs> And thank goodness I can say that. So the title of your book, the second part of it, is Joys and Science of the New Grandparenting. What do you mean by the science? Well, there's someone in the audience tonight who taught me about the biochemistry of grandmothering. Now, when I first had my grandchild, my first grandchild, I'm sorry about my voice, it's gonna crack and crack. Um, <clears throat> and I held her for the first time. I had the most extraordinary, enormous thunderbolt of elation and emotion that just went through my whole body. And I'd never felt like that before. I'd never felt loving like that before. That doesn't mean I didn't love my, my child, I did, but this was different. And it was almost deeper, if that's possible. And when I agreed to write the book, I was asked to write the book, and when I agreed to do it, I thought, well, I'm gonna go out and try to figure out what that was. And do other grandmothers have this feeling? And I called Dr. Luann Brizantine, who's sitting in the front row up here, <clears throat> who had written the most wonderful book that you have to read, called The Female Brain strongly recommend it. And uh, she, in the book, she talked about how mothers, when they hold their newborn babies, or even when they just give birth, their whole brain is rewired. An astonishing amount of the brain, mother's brain, is changed. And she starts secreting all kinds of hor new hormones, particularly bonding hormones, and grandmothers do the same thing. Hmm. And so this, emotion was really down here in my front part, <laughs> down in the front, and coursing all the way through my body. Uh, it was real, it was big, and my brain was being rewired, and I was secreting all kinds of bonding hormones that changed me deeply. So There we go, so that's one part of the science. There's right. more science in here right. about why, why there are grandparents particularly grandmothers in the first place. Most animals on the planet die when they can no longer reproduce. So you don't see bear grandmothers. You don't even see gorilla grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, they're still reproducing. You might have a grandmother, but she's having her own babies at the same time. H humans, elephants, and whales. We're the only ones who have menopause and live. And why, why? Well, a very wise anthropologist came up with the reason, and the reason is to babysit. Wow, <laughs> there it is. Well, you're laughing, but going back to the Stone Age, the grandmother stayed back and took care of the babies. Both parents went out and hunted. Both parents tilled the field and Grandmothers are meant from all of time to stay at home and take care of babies. So when we want to babysit and we beg to babysit, it's because we need to babysit. Wow. What kind of a grandmother was Dolly? Oh, my mother. <clears throat> First of all, she was a seriously tough mother. And the minute she became a grandmother, and I confess this happened to me too, I turned into a ball of mush. <laughs> she was so adorable with my daughter. My daughter could do no wrong. Things that she, my mother didn't want to do with me, she would do with, my, with her grandchild. <clears throat> and I discovered that this transformation is universal. All <laughs> mothers are policemen, and all grandmothers are playmates. <laughs> and fathers go through exactly the same thing. Fathers can't believe what happens to them when they fall madly in love with their 
grandchildren. Don't you have a quote in your book? Do you quote it? It may have been Tom Brokaw about bribery is a is a is a crime, but for grandparents, it's it's the way to go or something. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I think it's something like, it's like for, for bribery for most is a white collar crime, but right. for grandparents, it's a game plan. So that, that's it. <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> He's pretty funny. That so we, we may have some working moms in the room here. Um, you were a working mom. You were first hired by CBS in 1972. You were on Face the Nation from 1983 to 1991, uh, followed by 60 Minutes, where you continue to work. And you write in your book, in that first year, this is at 60 Minutes, I went to 18 different cities in nine countries, from Romania and Iraq to Israel and Russia. Was I ever home? No. And yes, I suffered. What kind of a mother was I? So, what kind of a mother were you? <laughs> uh, confession time. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was gone a lot, be, even before 60 Minutes, because I covered the White House. And if the president decides at 2 o'clock in the afternoon he thinks he'd like to go take a trip, you're on the plane. You have no choice. Even if your daughter has her play, she's starring in it, you go. So I missed a lot. Um, how did I do it? I did it because my, my husband worked at home. And he, he is and was a gifted parent. <clears throat> and the other thing was that my mother, clearly this woman has a huge force in my life, she uh, wanted my, me to have this career. And she kept telling me, it's OK, it's OK. So I never really had real guilt, because my mother was assuring me that this, the, the, the Taylor, that's my daughter, is going to turn out fine. And she did. She did. She's great. Yes, she She's did. She's really great. You write that three million grandparents in the United States have legal custody of their grandchildren. And 18% of them live below the poverty line. And you write, that there is a misconception that most custodial grandparents are African American. You did two 60 minute pieces where grandparents were the subjects. One was called The Loneliest People on Earth, and the other was The Grandparent Family Apartments in New York. So, what can you tell us about okay. that? I'll, I'll do the first one first, sure. because uh, this one really touched me. This was about children in foster care. Children who have nobody who, who would take them in. No aunt, no cousin, nothing. They, know, they knew nobody. And a project uh, was developed to try and find one relative for them to connect to. It was really a heartbreaking story. And I, 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 we focused on one child. I mean, the emotional, mental issues that they went through. <clears throat> she found her father, and he was a son of a, he was yeah. horrible. Uh, and she adored him, and he just could, could have cared less, and she still adored him. I've been trying to find her. Um, I wasn't allowed to know her last name, so I don't know her last name. Her first name was Beverly. I just want to know how, her story. I want to know what happened. Is she okay? Um, but what, what I learned from that story and from a psychiatrist I talked to, is that if you have one relative who loves you, that's all. That's all you need. It doesn't even have to be a relative. Somebody who's close to you. Um, for the book, I interviewed a psychiatrist. <clears throat> and she told me that <clears throat> the first question she always asks a new patient is, when you were young, who loved you? And if the answer was nobody, she said, I knew I was in deep trouble. I was, I was probably not going to be able to help very much. And I said to her, what if the answer is my grandmother? Is that enough? And she said, absolutely. Wow. So grandmother love is as all the grandmothers in the room. And I could tell there were a lot. How many of you are grandmothers? Whoa. There you go. Well, we know that we are giving them adoring, unfettered, unadulterated, unconditional love. And they know it. We feel it. And we are conveying it to them. And that's all a person needs, a little kid needs. 
oh. is to have that adoring, because their parents are really whip, trying to whip them into shape. <laughs> and along comes Granny saying, ah, you're perfect. Oh, Everything you right. did you put that right f uh, shoe on the right foot? Oh my God, you're a genius, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're, we're oh. totally over the moon. So what about the grandparent family apartments? In <clears throat> the York? grandparent fl family apartments I call the house in the Bronx. The city of New York uh, was inundated during first during the crack e epidemic and then again during this past recession with grandparents gaining full legal custody of their grandchildren. The reason for that is never pretty. Both parents are in jail, both parents are drug addicts, maybe there's only one parent who dies. <clears throat> it's never a good reason. Granny comes along and says, I'm not gonna throw this kid into foster care. I know what happens in foster care. I'm gonna take this child, gains legal custody, then what? If she was living in subsidized housing for, for the elderly, which was very likely, once she has a child, they kick her out. No children allowed in, in subsidized housing for the elderly. So the city of New York built this gorgeous apartment building in the worst congressional district in the country, in the Bronx, for grandmothers and great-grandmothers who are raising children. And it isn't just that they provided them with these beautiful apartments. They give them all kinds of services, help. <clears throat> they give the grandmothers tutoring and how to talk to a surly teenager. Wouldn't we all love to have that tutoring yeah. ourselves? And they tutor the kids. And they make sure those kids finish high school. And the, uh, the high school graduation rate out of that building is quite astonishing, given where they grow up. Um, the grandparents are taken on outings and treated uh, for morale sake uh, to uh, fun things to do because it is really hard, really hard for an elderly person to raise a young kid who's been rejected wow. in some way or another by his parents. Wow. So this building is unique. It's, it's in the worst neighborhood. They have guards at the door to protect them, security. It is something that other cities need to go and look at and try to replicate. Yeah. In your book, you describe a candid conversation that you had with Whoopi Goldberg, mm -hmm. who became a grandmother when Whoopi was 33. Can and you a just great tell a grandmother bit? at 56? Right. So Whoopi, um, <clears throat> I heard her. <clears throat> sorry, I heard her speak. Uh, I heard her being interviewed at, at a situation, something like this. And she told the audience that she wanted to have her career. It was very important to her. And she uh, was a single mother at that point. And so she called her mother. Uh, Whoopi lived around here, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And she, her mother was in Harlem. And she called her mother and said, will you come and help me raise, I forget the daughter's name. I, Anyway, come and help me raise my daughter. And the mother just left Harlem after a lifetime there and moved to Berkeley and took care of that little girl and basically raised her. It isn't that Whoopi wasn't in the picture, but Whoopi was having a huge career. Um, so she told me about that, about the grandmother who stepped in and uh, did that. She didn't have full custody, but she raised the kid. Right, and there's a wonderful photo in the book. Oh, I love that photo. Of Whoopi and her daughter, and her mother, and her daughter's child as well. Yeah, her daughter movie. then kind of acted, <clears throat> acted up. Yeah. And was furious as a teenager at her mother for not being around more. So she got pregnant. Yes, and I think and she was child. 14. And when she was 14, yeah. ergo Whoopi was a grandmother at 33. That's right. Wow. You have uh, a section in your book, and it's called Natural Enemies. And <laughs> Everybody's going to laugh at this one. The in-laws. <laughs> um, and here's a quote from your book. The image of mother-in-law as monster is global. And in fact, you talk about India, you talk about China, and you said even an act of kindness can bite you. 
<laughs> Talk to us about Okay, the, the act of kindness that can bite you. So your daughter-in-law <clears throat> works, and you're over at the house. Maybe you're taking care of the kid. Maybe you're allowed to spend an hour with the kid. I don't know. <laughs> and the house is messy. So as an act of kindness, you straighten up. Sounds reasonable. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> because it is likely to be read as, oh, she's insulting my housekeeping. Oh, she thinks I'm not doing a good job here. Uh, you know, and it was really an act of kindness. Your motive was pure and healthy, and you'll be crushed. Because that <clears throat> contest between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law for the heart of the prince is pretty universal in every society. They were writing about it back in the, the, uh, the, during the Roman Empire. This goes back and back. And um, it's almost unavoidable. And I have to say, <clears throat> based on my research, that the grandmother on the paternal side has a more difficult job than the other way around. Got it. And if you don't if you don't know it, don't listen to me. <laughs> but it's right. basically fundamentally right. That's right. the case. So, and I spoke to a psychiatrist, by the way, who said who told me that there are many, many men, men, the sons of the grandmother, who like to whip up the tension between the two women. They kind of <laughs> like it. Sorry, guys. And I t I write a lot about Franklin Roosevelt, with his mother and Eleanor vying for him, and what a horrible situation oh that was. God. But here's something I discovered about Eleanor Roosevelt, that she was not a very loving grandmother, and that Sarah, the great-grandmother, was the beloved one. And they called Sarah, all the grandchildren, her, called the great-grandmother Granny. And guess what they called Eleanor? Grand Mare. Oh, my God. Wow. Honest. Wow. Honest. In writing your book, you, you had a rather sensitive conversation with your daughter Taylor's mother-in-law, the other grandmother. Oh, right. And I, I found out a really touching oh, part in your book. Incredible. Books. So, so I'll, first I'll tell you how it came about. So I finished the first draft of, of the book, and the boss, the executive producer of 60 Minutes, is a brilliant editor. He sees our pieces, and he knows how to fix them, and he, he's just, he's a great eye and a great ear, and I trust him. So I asked him if he'd read the book, and he did. He gave me wonderful advice, and he then, at the end of our discussion of what he thought I should do and how to make it even better, he said, now, you mentioned the other grandmother once. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, you can't do that. You cannot write a whole book about your child and you being a grandmother and kind of brush that other woman, you know, as if she's not around. You can't. I said, well, I just didn't know how to write about her. I, I just didn't know how to do it. It was every time I tried, it, it, it just came out wrong. He said, well, you want my advice? Find a way. He said, did you ever talk to her about her being a grandmother? Why don't you interview her? I said, OK. So I marched down to my office. I called my son-in-law. I said, do you think your mother would give me an interview for my book? He said, I'll ask her. She said, yes. She's in Kansas City. I'm in my office. I called her. And I said, um, I'm going to interview you about being a grandmother. Now, don't think of me as Jordan's other grandmother. Think of me as a reporter, and I'm just calling you. I mean, we don't know each other. Try just to think of me as someone who's writing a book. So I think my first question was, do you think it's harder for the mother of the boy? Pause. Yes. Yes, yeah, she said. She said, the wife leans to her mother, and the husband leans to his wife. So that was amazing. I couldn't believe she said that. A couple of more questions about how much she loved the grandchildren. And then 
do you resent me? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. That popped out. Just popped out. Do you resent me? Well, there was a long pause the first time I asked her a question about this. This went on and on and on. And finally, yes. I know. I couldn't believe I'm sitting there. And she knows I'm doing it for the book, so she knows it's going to go in the book. And I said, well, why? And she said that uh, my husband and I <clears throat> can go to visit the grandchildren in California more often. And they can't. They can't afford it. And we can. And they resent it. And I thought, wow. And you know what? I had a rush of love for her. <laughs> and our relationship is so much better that we had this conversation. Um, I, I could have gone my whole life and not ever have discussed this with her. So if you're having any situations like that, I suggest you just bring it up. I know it's hard. It was really hard for me. But the air was cleared. And really, I'm going to Kansas City on my book tour, and she's giving me a party. <laughs> I know. Wow. I know. Wow. I mean, things really did change. Wow. So let's talk about grandfathers. Ooh. You have a section in your book about grandfathers. So first of all, what kind of a granddad is your husband, Aaron? Well, my, I, I, let me step back for sure. one second. Um, ba baby boom gr fathers, baby boom fathers changed the way grand, uh, fathering was conducted in the United States. <clears throat> Their wives were working, first wave of working women. They were obliged by uh, the fact that their wives were probably not cooking very much or doing much housework, whatever, um, to really step in. So they were the first wave of, of fathers who went to the soccer match, uh, uh, coached the soccer team or whatever else, basketball team in our case, uh, and were more involved fathers. They have gone over the edge as grandfathers. They are deep in the pool, <laughs> insanely in love with their grandchildren. Not that my grandfather wasn't with me, but this is even more hands-on. They're rolling around in the backyard. They're horse playing. Now, my husband has two granddaughters. And he, and there's a picture of this in the book, he's sitting on those little chairs having tea parties. Oh my god. <laughs> and playing dolls. Uh, unreal. Um, grandfathers today are just as smitten, just as madly in love with their grandchildren, just as surprised at themselves being little mush balls as we women are. And uh, Dr. Brizendine would probably tell you that they're being rewired as well, and they're having hormone <laughs> secretions or whatever that are changing their relationship. And what the doctor actually told me, this is the best, the, if I'm wrong, speak up, or correct me, that the wiring in us for baby love is the exact same wiring in us as romantic love. So what really does happen with our grandchildren is we fall madly in love, literally fall madly in love. And uh, those feelings are pretty close. They're pretty close. Wow. In the emotion and the, the, uh, I don't know, the joy, the elation, the need to see them, the ache for them, the yearning, all of that. We're in love. You have an anecdote in the book about Grandpa Robert Redford. I thought it was terrific. Can you tell us? Yeah. Tom Brokaw told me this wonderful story about Robert Redford. So he's in Sundance. I guess he owns a restaurant in Sundance. Yeah. And uh, Tom and he were having dinner together with Robert Redford's family. And they come out, and as Tom says after dinner, if the crowds around Sundance know that Redford's in the restaurant, they kind of accumulate out in front. And they kind of saunter as if they're, you know, just wandering around. <laughs> but what they're really doing is waiting to get a look at Robert Redford. And he, as he described it, was in full ref Redford. He was wearing a suede cowboy jacket with fringes and boots and the buckle and the whole thing. And he comes out, and he and Tom are doing the cowboy lope down the middle of the street. 
And this little red-headed kid comes running up, Grandpa Bob, Grandpa Bob. And he turns around and says, not in public. <laughs> 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 it's great. He told me an even better one, I thought. He just, he's really funny, and he told me great grandpa stories. I wanted to interview him, and he kept throwing out these great anecdotes. He had a friend who's, he wanted, whose grandson, he, no, a guy who wanted his grandson to call him Ned. So it's grandfather day at school, and Ned walks in. And the kid says, Ned, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm your grandfather. He said, you are? <laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> That's great. You are listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program, and our guest today is 60 Minutes correspondent Leslie Stahl. We're discussing her amazing career and the personal revelations that have come from grandparenthood. I am retired California Superior Court Judge and Grandmother Ladaris Cordell, your moderator. So let's talk about trans grandparents. Trans. Okay. Transgender. I know one, and I interviewed her for the book. So she was a he for a long time, uh, married, and a grandfather with a mustache in his 60s. I'm very bad with these pronouns. F forgive me if I'm saying something that isn't the least bit offensive, but I have to call him B, Babs, actually, Babs. Babs, a man when she, he, she was a man and a woman now. So Babs, as a man, was Barry. And um, fought in the war, you know, was a soldier of some, was Vietnam maybe? And turns 60 and decides, that he's transgender. And with the wife's acceptance and help, went through the entire change. Horrible, painful electrolysis, Adam's apple shaved. And his wife, her wife, um, taught Babs how to use her hands, how to dress, how to put makeup on. And I said, that's just wonderful. And what about the grandchildren? And he said, she said, what about the grandchildren? And I said, well, what do they call you? Because Babs is a grandmother. She said, oh, they still call me Pops. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it just, oh, after I interviewed her for the book about being a trans grandmother, um, she threw her first shower, first baby shower, for her daughter, who was pregnant, with the other with the, with the son's wife, yeah. And they threw the shower together. And she called me up, she said, I don't know what to do. I've never even been to a shower. <laughs> what, what should I do? That's so sweet. great. She was wonderful. So another kind of grandparent, the surrogate. Oh, surrogate. So I found your story in the book describing Hope Meadows to be so inspiring and so touching. What is Hope Meadows? This is, this is a community. Um, that started in a small, small little community in northern Illinois, in Rantoul, Illinois, by a woman who was appalled by the foster care system. She was an academic. She was writing her PhD thesis on the foster care system and was appalled that children were being shunted from one family, then rejected, sent to another family, rejected again, reject and they're in the foster care system to begin with because they were rejected. She couldn't stand it. She just couldn't bear it. And she said, I have to do something. So she talked the Pentagon, and this took 1,000 phone calls, into oh. giving her a tract of land at an air base that was closing. So she said, I need 12 houses. I'm going to put these foster care children in these houses. I just need 12. They gave her 80. They said, take it or leave it. They sold her. 80 gorgeous, beautiful houses in a beautiful, lovely suburb, really, for $250,000. 80 houses for 250. She said, I couldn't say no to that. So she had 80 houses. She, her plan was to persuade 12 parents, and in some cases they were single women, but 12 parents, 
to adopt a family of foster kids in return for free housing and the community of all these people living together so that if they had the urge to reject, the community would come in and support them and get them over the hump. That was the concept. What's she gonna do with the other 60 odd houses? 70 houses, what's she gonna do? So she decides she's just going to rent them out to senior citizens at very low rent, just to fill up the neighborhood, because you can't have empty houses. So she puts ads in AARP magazines and things like that, and she fills up all her houses with senior citizens. And organically, without plan, without anybody telling them what to do, these elderly people become grandma and grandpa. Not to everybody, but to this kid and that kid. And these senior citizens are helping the parents. You can't imagine, they take four and five kids because they take all the siblings. It, it, it's really a job for 19 people, one house. And these seniors come in, and when the mother can't take it anymore and just doesn't know what she's gonna do except run off, the seniors come in and they let the mother go drive around for an hour and cool off, and the, senior, and the kids are different with the seniors. That's grandma and grandpa. And those seniors love those kids the way we love ours. They think they're wonderful. They have that face of adoration on those children. And this community is totally thriving. These kids are finishing school. The seniors are getting them through school. There's a story I tell in there about a little boy who was really a tough kid. He was hitting the other kids. He was belligerent. He had behavioral issues. He'd already been kicked out of one school. So two grandfathers, George and Henry, two grandfathers, decide they're going to take him to school every day and sit with him. One every other day, one did. They went to school with him and sat beside him. And if he started to act up, put their arm around him, calmed him down, and they brought this kid around. They just brought the kid around to become, you know, a person who could control his impulses. And the grandparents, the surrogate grandparents are doing it. It is a community and a half. They're building others. There's one in Portland, Oregon. There's one in Amherst, Massachusetts, there's one in DC, there's one now in New Orleans, so they're spreading. And it's really a successful project. And senior citizens um, who are retired and sit home and watch television all day, because that's what these senior citizens were doing before they moved to this community, um, have had their lives transformed, their health improved, their sense of mission and purpose has made them, has, has, has led them to tell me that this is the happiest chapter of their lives. Wow. And many of them have children and grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. We have many, many questions from the audience, so let's go to those. How do you think being a grandparent has impacted Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? <laughs> Great question. <clears throat> Who asked that? Who has that? Will you admit it? It's a great question. Um, I happen to know the answer on Hillary. I'll tell you why. Because I asked a pollster, a Republican pollster, <coughs> excuse me, if I could go to New Hampshire with him, this is one year ago, uh, and just participate in a focus group. This was a year ago when Scott Walker was everybody's number one. Rubio is everybody's number two. <laughs> Christie was coming up, and Jeb Bush was at the bottom, at the very bottom. They really did not like Jeb Bush in New Hampshire a year ago. And of course, Donald Trump was nowhere. He was not on the radar anywhere. So after he finished asking about the candidates, he, on my behalf, said, what one word would you say describes Hillary Clinton? So they're all Republicans, and the words were dishonest, uh, 
liar, cold, untrustworthy, on and on and on, just like that. And I will tell you, there are democratic focus groups saying some of those same words, but it's beside the point. I then got up and I said to the group, what one word describes grandmother? Warm, loving, cookies, lap, hugs, unconditional love, warmth. So then I asked them, so if Hillary Clinton is a grandmother, will that soften her image? Now these were self-described conservative Republicans and a considerable number of them said yes. So I was kind of surprised by that. What surprised me even more, because I'm, I assume that Hillary Clinton's had her own focus groups on this subject, that she doesn't talk more about that, about her being a grandmother. Because I do think it would soften her image um, and, and maybe take away some of the rough edges of this idea that she's so untrustworthy. And the other thing I found out about grandmothers is that the public will accept an older woman, grandmother, in a position of authority much more easily than they'll accept a young woman in a position of authority. And so being a grandmother would also help her on that front. I know she does talk about it, but not that much. Hmm. And I'm curious, I don't know why she, do, she doesn't. What about Mr. Trump? Now, Mr. Trump has, I th I, this is just a, an observation. I've done no work on it. I've just watched him the way you have. <clears throat> but I think he uses it from time to time um, to help his, to, to kind of work on the women vote. Because he has such a terrible, problem with women, and I think he throws it out there to say, I'm a, I'm a grandpa. You have to like, you know, he knows it's lovable to be a grandpa. He gets that, and I think he's using it to soften his image. What I find fascinating is that there are the three leading candidates are grandparents. I thought this was going to be a, a, a time when Hillary would be badgered for being old. I thought age was going to be an issue, and the Republicans were going to use it against her, or at least try to. And look what's happened. There's no age issue, because they're all up there. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not even the oldest in the group, so right, there you go. Right. All right, another question. Imagine, my doorbell rings. On my doorstep is Leslie Stahl and her camera person. What should I do? What should I not do? Are you think I'm going to tell you? <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Forget that question. Tear that Moving off. on. Moving on. <laughs> Next one. I love your interview style. Of which interview are you most proud? Well, um, I will tell you not which interview I'm most proud. Because when you ask a question out of the blue like that, you have to go with what pops into your head first, right? And I'll tell you maybe one of the most difficult interviews I've ever had, um, and how much the audience loved that it was difficult for me to have this interview. It was live, it was on Face the Nation, so a long time ago, with Margaret Thatcher. And she had come to the United States, she came often, every year I think, to see her pal Ronald Reagan. This was the height of the Iran-Contra scandal when Reagan was really taking a big hit. We think that he was popular the whole time, but he wasn't. He had his ups and downs, and this was a serious down. And he was being accused of not being honest, hello Hillary, not being honest because he always said he wasn't selling arms to Iran or giving arms to Iran. <clears throat> he was really suffering. And he had basically kind of disappeared. He, we didn't see him for a while. So her, she comes over to kind of buck up her, her pal, Margaret Thatcher. And she did, and then she came on Face the Nation. She did one interview every time she came over, and it was my turn, Face the she did it in a rotation. So I asked her uh, how she could trust Ronald Reagan. He lied to her about these weapons. And she said, my dear, the, I remember her doing this a lot, the relationship between our two countries is solid, solid, and there is no problem between us whatsoever. 
So I didn't think that was a good answer. So basically <laughs> asked it again in a slightly different way. But she knew I was asking it again. So now she's sitting up straight. She's leaning in toward me in a slightly aggressive way. And uh, I ask her, how can you? But, but he lied to you. He lied to your government. How can you possibly stay pals with him? Now it's my personal relationship with Ronald Reagan is, has never been better. It's as firm as it's always been. <laughs> we are together. And she kind of slaps me around a little bit. <laughs> can you believe that I asked it again? What was I thinking? <laughs> Now it's me. She is going to get me. Why does it seem that I love your country more than you do? <laughs> she did. Oh my god. Live television. There's no such thing as saying, cut <laughs> or stop the tape. This is live television. Well, that interview ended really quickly after that. And she stormed out. Now, my impression, well, I said thank you, it ended. It wasn't that she tore off the mic, but she left quickly. And honestly, my impression sitting there was that she wasn't really angry, that she's appalled. She's been in situations like that, if you've ever seen that question time in Parliament. And it was a little game for her. I was wrong. She was really mad. <laughs> and the guy who had arranged the interview was feared for his job. However, Face the Nation, she, first of all, had never gotten any mail ever for the interviews that she had already done every single year since she was prime minister in the United States. She gets bags and bags and bags of mail telling her, thank God you told her a thing or two, and on and on. Wow. And I got bags and bags of mail saying, thank God she told you where you wow. sit and so forth. So I wrote her a note telling her about my mail and that I had heard about hers. And she wrote back, and I have it in my bookcase, Dear Miss Stahl, cheer up, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> That's great. It was, it, I mean, story. she's a pro. She wasn't mad after she got all that mail. Then she thought she'd done a really good thing. <laughs> That's wow. Another question. You broke into an all-male profession. Are you pleased with the way broadcast journalism has treated up-and-coming women? Um, huge progress since my days, early days, my beginning. Uh, enormous progress. Um, you look at all the women who are covering the campaigns. The campaigns are basically being covered by women. I mean, to get an assignment on a campaign uh, for a woman when I started in the early 70s was Wow, you, you had just gone up to heaven. In fact, just to be hired and be in the room was heaven. You know, we, we just to be in the door. So, I mean, we have come just in enormous strides. And I think that uh, my profession is pretty friendly to women, except when you get to the executive suite. Mm. And it's almost like everywhere else. The ladder goes up and up and up and up and then it stops. Um, it's frustrating because the women's rights movement of the early 70s opened the doors and you thought, well, we're all going to earn it. We're not going to leap to the head of the line. We're going to earn it. We're going to go step by step. We're going to be a judge. We're going to be a doctor. We're going to be an airline pilot. And we're, gonna, we're not going to uh, do it without putting in the work and we will be appreciated because we're going to do good work. And then we still have a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. So it's frustrating, and you can't really clearly explain it. Now, if Hillary becomes president, maybe that's a breakthrough. I don't know. But it does seem to me that it should, what it, meaning women completely on a par with men up to the very top, should have happened already. You know, what, what, what's going on here? Well, what it, is this? It's interesting because I always have this this thought that we had a black president before we have we have still haven't had a female president, and it's just women. We're we're we are not even moving as fast, and and there is, seems to be more resistance to women moving up the ladder than even people of color. 
But I'm, I'm, I really do believe that older women are getting a better break. Um, Nancy Pelosi, she was a grandmother when she became speaker. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, well, I don't know when they put her on the court. But no, she's a grandmother, but I don't know if she was one. But um, I think I do think this idea that older women are more acceptable in positions of authority. Maybe we just we boomers are just too young. <laughs> I mean, to be between fifty and seventy is to be too young. <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm baffled by it. Another question: Who's the scariest person you ever interviewed? Ma Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, there was a general who really intimidated me. I can see him. I can't remember his name. But I didn't, <clears throat> didn't even interview him in person. I interviewed him, you know, over lines. So he was in Iraq or something, and I was in Washington. And he just, he really, he just shut me down. I can't think of many times I was shut down either, but he, he totally intimidated me. Wow. Yeah. So but, what, but not many, I have to say, not many. What about the most joyous, wonderful person? Oh, here, I have here. one. <clears throat> so I covered Washington for 20 years. And we were not allowed to like in a, any obvious way. We were not allowed to dislike in any obvious way. We were not allowed to have an opinion or an emotion. I once kind of smiled in a story uh, at the end of the story on tape and I was made to go out and redo it without the smile, so no emotion whatsoever. So I get to 60 Minutes, this is my third story at 60 Minutes, <clears throat> on a brain surgeon. He was at the Mayo Clinic. He was one of the, he was the brain surgeon you went to when you were inoperable. He was the last resort <clears throat> and he would go in when no one else would even dare to. His name was Thorvald Sunt. He had bone cancer. And he was in excruciating pain. <clears throat> so bad that he had to wear a whalebone corset because even his clothes brushing up against his rib cage was excruciating. He was like that except when he operated. And when he operated, there was no pain. He went there. Concentration, so complete, adrenaline flowing. Um, and I totally, 100% loved him. Loved him. Um, I loved his spirit. I loved that he didn't complain. I loved that he was bald, of course. He was on all kinds of chemo. And he had a little boy while we were there who he, who he operated on with a brain tumor. And the little kid was bald. And he got down on his hands and knees with the little kid, and he said, look at us. Look at us. We both have cancer, and look what's happened to us. But we're going to pull through. He was just a, a heavenly person. I bring the tape back, and I say to my boss, you, you, this is my third story. I filmed this whole story. It's great. It's wonderful. You're not going to run it. He said, why? I said, because it's obvious I like this man. It's clear. And, you, and he looked at me. He said, hey, this is 60 Minutes. This is a human interest story you're allowed to like. <laughs> and I love that. I was joyous. That was just, I was allowed to Great. like. Great. And I've done several of those, you know, human interest stories with extraordinary people who are a surprise, whatever they are doing in their life. And you just, you love them. And the audience loves them. And we right. can show it. So a little more in 60 minutes. How are specific segments assigned? And whoever pitches the story the best, or how does that work? Um, well, first of all, we each have teams of, of producers. And everybody on a team is responsible for coming up with story ideas. And uh, they, th my team, for example, would propose a story to me. And if I like it, <clears throat> if I like it, we then write up a blue sheet. And we submit it uh, to the boss. So he's reading a paragraph or two, describing what the story is. If he also likes it, it then has to go through the next process, meaning we have to present a budget. And if the budget's approved, uh, then we do the story. I, uh, 
I told my team about five years ago that if they ever proposed a story to me that took place in Los Angeles, where my grandchildren lived, That's right. I would say yes. They didn't even have to tell me what the story was. I would go, and that's exactly what's, I've done a huge amount of story. <laughs> what do you think about social media and how it has impacted journalism? Yeah. Well, journalism is fast changing. Um, I think I'm, the, I'm one of the very, very lucky ones in this business because I still do what I've done for years. But most journalists are uh, having to work on the story for many different platforms. Let's say they work for a newspaper. Then they also have to write blogs and go on the newspaper's website. And, uh, perhaps they have to file 35 times a day. Um, when I started in journalism, we would take a full day like overnight even, to work on a story, because everything was on film, and film had to be processed, and that took hours. So we really had the time to make the phone calls, do the research, get the background, hear opposing views, and weigh and measure, and think, actually think. Um, cable came in, in uh, when George H. Herbert Walker Bush was president, and now the time to think was shrinking because the cable uh, reporters basically had to hear something and very quickly run out to the lawn at the White House, for instance, to give the report. Now, they didn't have to do it instantly, but pretty quickly. So now the time to think has come down this far. Now, with social media and with the internet, boom, you hear it and it's out there without much time for thoughtful questioning, calling around, getting opposing views. This doesn't mean that there isn't a huge appetite for the old kind of journalism. And there are a lot of reporters who are leaving newspapers and going to the internet, starting little newsrooms of investigative reporters to do long form journalism. And you're going to see more and more of that on the internet. In a way, the internet allows you to do all different kinds of journalism long form, short form, everything. Um, and I think over time, people will gravitate to the kind of journalism they want, and a lot want the kind of things we do. Our audience is fine, we're doing great. So I know there are people want the in-depth, and it, you'll find it on the internet. Look, going out and looking for it's a challenge for people my age, <laughs> but it's there if you really want to find it. Well, that and it being, will be there more. That being said, polls show journalists not rating much better than politicians oh, in know. terms of credibility. Yeah, absolutely. Does that sadden you? Or? Sadden me. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's, 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 it's harmful for the, for the health of our country. We are the fourth estate. We are the reason that our system over the years has been able to cleanse itself. And, uh, and fix what's broke. And if the public doesn't trust us, which it doesn't, um, they don't listen to us. So if we say so-and-so is not telling the truth, they shrug. Um, I, my own analysis is that at some point, the mainstream press, media, and the opinionated press, and the bloggers and the screamers all got put into the same salad bowl. We're all called media, and the public doesn't differentiate. And so we're all tarred by it. We're all tarred by uh, people who scream and aren't telling the truth, people who demean other people. We're all in there together, and it's hurt, the, it's hurt my profession. And as I say, the worst part of it is, is that it's not healthy for the country. I'm going to switch back to your book for a moment. At you the mean very, my book? Your book. <laughs> your book. Uh, at the end of the book, you conclude with a call to arms. And what is it you want us to do? Okay, at the end of the book, I say, 
grandparents, whatever your relationship is with your son or daughter or daughter-in-law, fix it and go help them. Go there and help your children raise your grandchildren. Usually, in most cases, both parents are working. They're having a rough time with this economy. They, they need good babysitting. Daycare is hideously expensive, as I said before. They need us in there. We are spending already, by the way, grandparents are already spending a fortune on our grandchildren. Listen to this one. We are spending seven times more on our grandchildren than grandparents did just 10 years ago. And you all know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, we are not buying toys. We are buying toys, but only toys. We're buying the crib. We're buying the car seat. We're paying the medical bills. We're paying the date. We're paying the, the nanny or the babysitters. Um, they need us. We need those babies. We need them because we're meant to help raise them. It's in our, our, our human genome or whatever. It's part of who we are. We need them for our health and our happiness. But most of all, the babies need us. Children need to know they come from a family. Children need to know there's a history. And children need to see this face, that face, shining on them to know that they're wonderful. Because their parents are always telling them, don't do this, don't do that, whatever. <laughs> we don't do that. We're there to tell them they're wonderful and to give them confidence and to help them. Kids talk more to their grandparents and more, to, more truth be told, to their grandfathers than they do to their parents. Children like their grandparents more on Facebook than they like their parents on Facebook. <laughs> they need us. And my call to arms is if you're mad at your kid, Get over it. If the kid's <clears throat> mad at you, grovel. <laughs> Tell them you were wrong. Tell them, you know, whatever they want. Just get in there. That's my call to arms. Wow, it's wonderful. <laughs> well, we have now reached the point in our program where we have time for only one last question. You have led and continue to lead an amazing life, breaking through glass ceilings, taking journalism to new heights, and really touching people with your stories about humanity. So, who should portray you in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who is the sexiest actress out there right now? I want to know. Okay. Uh, I, I have one. I have one. But maybe you won't think she's. What do you think about Kate Blanchett? Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Good? All right. Kate Blanchett. <laughs> Love it. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our, thanks to, our thanks to Leslie Stahl, correspondent for CBS's 60 Minutes and author of the new book, Being Grandma, The Joys and Science of the New Grandparenting. We also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. We also remind everyone here that Ms. Stahl's new book is for sale and she'll be signing copies down front following this program. I'm Judge Ladaris Cordell and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.